Hello and thank you for joining us for the latest Autodesk webinar with Car Design News. I'm Owen Reedy, the editor of Car Design News. In this webinar, we're going to focus on seamless data preparation pipeline in VRED Professional, showing you how current workflows in VRED help to create um, and to quickly assemble and prepare your data. With us today, we have Autodesk Claudio Boyle, a professional VRED trainer for the automotive industry and CGI agencies, with particular expertise in the high-end visualization industry. With more than five years of uh, process experience in automotive visualization, Claudio will provide valuable guidance in using VRED and also in implementing VRED into existing structures. Before we start, I'd like to remind you all to submit questions for Claudio during the workshop, which you'll answer in the Q&A session after his presentation. You can do this by typing into the box on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Also, if you experience any technical issues during this, this session, please also type these into the Q&A box, and our team will do their best to sort today. Um, I'd like to give a quick um, and very common overview over what um, data preparation um, means actually. Um, <clears throat> that is all um, I'm going to start with the first slide here. Um, the data preparation pipeline in FRED or um, regarding FRED um, is founded on um, a data preparation or product lifecycle management that contains all the data provided by um, departments like construction, design and development and a few others um, in a company. So that means that all these um, specific departments offer or publish their data into that kind of product lifecycle management system that holds all these data sets. That may be surface information or construction data, design, um, design milestones, Things like that are, are being stored in that uh, product lifecycle management, but still they are all independent data sets um, being held in that uh, kind of data uh, database. Um, what Fred Professional does is take these data sets and put them all together and make it possible to use, in the end, to use a data set that is fit for single source publishing. Um, that is very um, globally spoken because what does single source publishing mean? Single source publishing means that you use one and the same data set in an optimum, uh, optimal environment um, to use it for very various um, purposes like virtual prototyping. That means that you um, show the deciders in your company at every milestone of the development of your product um, the current state of your development. So, and that state has to be visualized as well, um, as soon as possible, um, to reduce the risk of um, misinvestment, for example. As well as interactive presentation, so you um, decide to show your customer um, the current state of development or your product, for example. Um, then the same data set can be used to um, produce high-end imagery, um, which means for magazines, things like that, online web image production. Um, another thing one can do with that data set is also to use it for point of sale systems. That means that you go to a, um, <coughs> to a car se a seller and you have a um, sophisticated um, visualization system running there using FRED, for example, um, that shows a specific data set of a car, for example. And you can customize your car um, with all the functions and all variants that this car offers and then you have a price at the end and you can buy it there. And all this is being um, realized by using FRED Professional by Autodesk. So data import and um, data preparation itself is being done in FRED Professional. So uh, FRED Professional organizes all the unorganized, first unorganized data uh, from the product lifecycle management and then gives you the 
capabilities or options to um, clean up and reorganize your data so that you give it a kind of logical structure first because that is the foundation for your, for your project. And after that, when you have reorganized your data and made sure that everything um, is fine and working, then you are tending to shading, lighting, and things like variant logic implementation, which means that you um, give this whole data set, which contains maybe hundreds of logical variants, a logical structure. And after that, you verify your data set and then it's fit for production or it's fit for, uh, for publishing in inventory, for example. Um, the term data preparation itself, well, it describes a process that involves the reorganization of data, its log logical structure and the visual re representation or presentation for various purposes. Um, the term is a bit diffuse since it relies on the purpose the data is being prepared for. Um, the specific steps for them can be optional. Um, well, nevertheless, data preparation and the preparation for the publishing is the most important part in the visualization pipeline, at least in my eyes, because I have been telling my customers all the time that they have to uh, take a very close look and very detailed look at their data before they um, proceed in processing the data sets. So, um, the process itself um, can be described as the following, because well, um, to come to a multi-purpose data set, which is um, the goal uh, after organizing your data, um, you have to take a few steps. But what do you gain from it? What do you, what do, what do you get? Um, you get a clean, correct, and fast, and especially reusable data set, which is fit for various applications. You have, after you've been shading it and lighting it, you have the highest image quality possible depending on the deadline for the pro project because well you have you always have deadlines and you have like to produce something at the end and this has a deadline and you have to achieve the highest quality or the highest image quality possible in the time you have and you have to um, create a data set that is fit for automating processes um, which I meant by um, creating compatibility for algorithms. Um, speaking of the detailed process in FRED, which is the most interesting part of this webinar, um, I'd like you to take a closer look at this slide here. The data preparation process in FRED. This is very interesting to people who have never uh, worked with FRED before if, uh, because they don't know really how to implement FRED in their existing structures. Um, Regarding that, I'd like um, to add a few comments to, um, to the chart you have here. Um, the first step itself is the data import, of course. You have to import data into FRED before you um, actually work with it. And that can be done via um, a file structure, which you have in your local network environment, for example. So it's just plain files. Or you have a PLM system. So after you imported that, or after you have told Fred to import this data set, you have the option of tessellation, which means that if you don't have polygonal data, you have to tessellate it first, or you can tessellate it before um, further, uh, further processing. That would be the, the next step. After that, um, you would have to um, optimize the scene graph. The scene graph is the logical representation of a data set. Um, so after you've been reorganizing it and giving it a logical structure, you can make sure that you don't have unnecessary nodes um, and therefore reduce complexity of your data set. That means that you don't have um, such a complex data set anymore and have a better overview of it. After you've been importing and reorganizing, you have to check if your um, geometry is correct and intact. So. What does that mean? You have to check for your duplicates, missing false and corrupt geometry, things like that, as well as correct your normal, um, your normals uh, for the consistency. Um, well, that for the geometry, I will give a few, um, a few examples later on in a live pres presentation and demonstration. Um, but after you've made sure that your geometry is intact, you can or this is an optional step, actually. You can add variants and group them into logical variant sets. 
What is a variant? A variant means one specific variant of a part. Let's say you have 20 existing steering wheels. So all these steering wheels for themselves are one variant, okay, or one logical set in a variant. So you can set this variant to a specific steering wheel. And a variant set is a um, combination of different variants. Let's say you want to have, let's say you have a Volkswagen and um, you want to show or um, to activate the look of a GTI, for example. That's the very sporty version of it. Then you have a few things that you have to um, set up first. Um, you can do this all by one click. And in this variant set that you clicked, for example, are the settings that set the steering wheel for a very specific steering wheel with specific leather and electronic devices and car pin, for example, and a very stylish rim, for example. These are all settings that can be combined into one variant set that can all be configured and set and, um, for example, configured for a for a key on your keyboard. And then by pressing that key, all those variants are being set up and show you um, the variant set that you've created and the car that you want. For example, the GTI, as I told. This is a variant set. But I will give an, um, an example later on. Um, the next step after, um, well, this is, this, there we have to make a logical cut because now we are um, dealing with the visualization. Before that, we have been dealing with the logical structure of a data set. Now we are dealing with its uh, optics, so with its visuals. So the next step would be the shading. So um, either we have an existing, uh, existing material library or we have to create new materials. So that means we have to use our shading system and create new materials that we apply to those objects. Um, depending on um, the application you're dealing with, may it be interactive presentation, for example, where performance is necessary, or you have high-end image uh, generation where quality is necessary, you have to optimize your shaders, or you have to um, set up the shaders the way that they work best for your, for your application. After that, you are dealing with the lighting, so you can add global lighting, like an environment map, for example, that lights your whole scene and adds reflection and um, light emission information to your scene. And then you can add accent lights, so that means that you um, light specific parts in your car, like the entertainment system, for example, or the seats. And then you have the option of adding object lights, so incandescent lights that glow, for example, your instruments. Optional to that, to the lighting, you can uh, calculate um, the ambient occlusion pass. This is a map that is being mapped, or a um, pre-calculated shadow map, self-shadowed map, that is being applied to your scene and gives a impression of real uh, reality or a realistic um, shadow impression. But this one is not being calculated uh, in real time. It is pre-calculated and then uh, not touched anymore. Um, well, one of the last steps would be the inter interactivity. So, there you have the options um, under more, for example, um, to create animations and uh, play those animations as well. So, um, that regarding, for example, the interactive um, presentation or you are rendering movies where your car is actually driving through your, through your view. Then you have the option of um, combining animations with nodes in your scene. So that means once you click a specific node that is being linked to an animation, this animation is being played. So um, I'm going to de demonstrate that one later on. And the last part, well, this doesn't really belong to data preparation anymore, but after that, of course, you are optimizing your render settings and render all the stuff you've been doing. Um, after that, that data set should be fit for things like high-end image production, configurators, for example, point-of-sale systems, and so on. Um, I hope you didn't get uh, too bored <laughs> until now, because um, now comes a more interesting part. I would like to switch to my um, live presentation or my live demo. Uh,
to do this, I have to close my presentation and switch to Fred Professional, which was run, running in the background. Um, this is a model from our local resources. Um, I have been preparing that one to show you a few um, features of Fred that help you uh, during your, um, your data preparation process. So, um, as I said, the first step would be the data import. Um, I've been leaving that one out because um, that is a process that may take too much time right now. And, um, well, I'd like to begin with the scene graph. As you can see to your left, you can see the scene graph, which has been collapsed at first. Okay, I can expand that one by clicking these plus icons here. And there you can see the logical structure of my, of my whole scene here, for example, interior, exterior parts, and so on. This data set has been used a couple of times, so please um, bear with me and bear with this data set, because it's just being made fit for this presentation to show you a few things. Okay, so the scene graph is uh, a bit tricky because many people ask me, or um, well, they have support requests because they didn't really get the scene, gra the scene graph at first. The problem, or well, well, the feature <laughs> it offers you is that it is hierarchical. So it offers a hierarchy. What does that mean? Um, globally spoken, all the child nodes belonging to a parent node inherit all their settings from the parent node. So let's say you have a node like that one. That is a group node. This one doesn't carry any transformation information, but that one does because it has those little arrows here, because it has been transformed at some point. All of its child nodes, that one for example, inherits the information stored in that node here. So, and if you keep that in mind, then it becomes pretty tricky after a while uh, if you go deeper into your scene graph and uh, like have a very complex data structure where um, some of these nodes appear um, within your data structure and it becomes very tricky to deal with those um, once you have no overview anymore. Um, it is not only tricky but very helpful sometimes. You have to keep in mind that this we, have, we don't keep this without a reason. We don't have the system without a reason. Um, the reason behind it is that um, with this system, it becomes very easy to create dependent animations, for, uh, for example. So one application could be, or one, one, one case could be, that we move the whole car so that it drives through a view, but at the same time you have to rotate your wheels because no car is uh, driving around without rotating its wheels. Um, so this dependent animation does not have to be, um, well, it's it is easy to do it because we have only to rotate the, the wheel itself and since it's being, uh, well, since it inherits all the information that is being uh, stored in its parent node, for example, that one here, because there is an A, there has been an animation key to it, um, it depends on, on the translation of the car. So we don't have to do it twice. So we just move the whole car, so we translate it on, on the x-axis, for example, and then we rotate, it, uh, rotate all the wheels for themselves. Only the rotation is being key to those, uh, to those wheels and nothing else. And we're done. So this way you can create very complex animations without having to deal with the overall animation anymore. So we key or um, complete only one sub-animation or one, one movement that has nothing to do with, with the other ones. That is very tricky and you have to understand how this works before um, before working with the scene graph. On the one side, it's a bit tricky to understand at first, but later on, when you when you get used to it, it's very very helpful, and it makes processes faster. Okay, well, I don't uh, want to go too much into detail with the scene graph here because it's it's pretty boring to deal with that one. Uh, the next step actually would be to check the geometry. Okay, as you can see, two wheels are missing. Well, two two complete wheels are missing, not only the tires, but um, everything. Well, there are very easy steps um, to um, get rid of the problem here, because that is a very uh, very common problem that uh, data sets have. So what are we going to do? I don't want to make a mess of it, so I just have to mirror 
um, these wheels onto the other side. And how do I do that? Okay. Well, at first I select the wheel or the, the tire that I'm uh, dealing with or that I want to mirror and select the parent group of it. And that should be that one here. I can activate the wireframe. Okay, there we have a problem already, a problem that I've been uh, implementing into that uh, project here. We have the tire that has been merged with um, the rear tire, the rear left tire. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we split those up? That's a very easy task. I just right click it here, go to edit, or, well, it's better to do that with the geometry editor. We have the separate objects tab in the geometry editor. 180 or 179 is the threshold and defines, okay, we are splitting completely independent parts here. And then it takes a bit uh, of time, a few seconds. It's a chance for me to drink something. Okay, this is um, a very highly detailed model, so it takes a bit of time. Okay, now it's done. Well, and I can expand the result. Okay, there seem to be um, five objects, five independent objects, but as I see it, if I turn on the bounding boxes. Okay, that one, you can't really see that in a presentation, but that one is a part back here. And that belongs to that tire here, to that wheel. And we have another one at the front, I guess. Yeah, exactly. That one is at the front and belongs to that wheel here. So what I'm going to do is I have to remerge those parts. It's very easy to do. Just going to group those and merge those. And the same goes for the rear parts. Okay, and there we are. So I have um, split up those both um, tires and wheels and made them independent from each other. So what I have to do is, well, that's the last thing to do. So I have to put the one for the rear into the group of the rear. Well, okay, now it's the other way around. Front left, there we are. Okay, so that's it. That's how I get rid of those um, mistakenly um, merged, uh, merged objects. And um, what we initially wanted to do was um, to mirror the whole wheel onto the other side. And that's pretty easy to do. The only thing I have to do is select the whole wheel, go onto a right click, edit, and now I have the option of duplicating it and flushing the created um, the created duplicate. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, it must be Y. Okay, so there we are. And since the model is being, or was modeled exactly on the grid, which is not being shown right now, I think this is due to the presentation mode, um, it is being mirrored on the axis to the other side which is very easy, so it's only three clicks probably, and you're done. Okay, the same goes for the rear. Duplicate, mirror, Y, and flush it. Okay, that's it, that's it. Now we're done with geometry tracks. That's the only, uh, this were the, the only mistakes I have been implementing in that file, just to show you. Okay, well, that's for the geometry check. So um, logical structure is something you have to do, it's just a bit of work. So um, this depends on your, on your application and what you're actually doing. Um, what is more interesting is um, the variance in the variance sets. So um, I know for a fact that we have a ceiling node here. And in that ceiling node, we have antennas and a sunroof. The problem with the antennas is that currently all of them are being shown at the same time, which is just wrong. So what do we do? As I mentioned earlier on, we have the option of creating so-called variants. A variant has different settings as for um, every um, variant of the antenna one. How do I do that? How do I implement a variant set or a variant at first? I can simply right-click on that, on that parent node 
and then ca I can convert that group node into a switch node. Okay, what happens now is that the switch node deactivates the visual for all these three um, variants. What I now have to do is going, uh, well, I'm going to reactivate them. The same goes for the sunroof. I'm going to create or convert it to a switch. As you can see, none of them are being displayed, so there's a hole in there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to activate them and make uh, the variants visible. So in scene variants, we have the variant module. What I need to do is to update uh, the library here by right-click and create all. And now we have the entries for the antenna right here and the sunroof down there. And now none is chosen, so none is being displayed. What I'm going to do is I'm going to activate one of them. And as you can see, the whole geometry is being set to visible or invisible for each of the states. Okay, I'm going to leave the sunroof and I'm going to activate the antenna. And now I can choose which one I want. Let's say, oh, well, oh, that one's nice. I'm going to leave it at that. So, how do I create a composition of those both variants? This is just an example. In real life, you could combine hundreds of variants into one variant set and make it a very complex variant so that you can switch to a very specific car in a very specific configuration in one second or in a few seconds at least. It just takes some time to switch all, all the geometry. Um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to show you how the variant set work. Okay, in scene variant set, we have the variant set module. And as we can see, there are already a few pre-configured. I'm going to leave them first. I'm going to create a new one, okay? And I'll say, okay, I have no idea what I'm going to call that one. Let's say variant one. Variant one, okay. And this variant one variant set, um, has to carry a very specific um, setup here. Um, okay, I'm going to switch geometry. That's that's a fact. And now I have to drag that very specific state into my variant set. And now it, ha it has become an entry in my geometry variant set. And the same I'm going to do with the sunroof. And now we ha we have a very specific setup for these two examples. I'm going to duplicate that one variant two. And now I have the chance to um, change these entries here. Let's say I have a variant 2 that carries a different configuration. So I'm going to switch that one to variant 1, for example, and that one to that. Okay. And now what happens if I do double click those entries here? Nothing happens because that one is already active. But what happens if I click variant 2? Okay. Well, my configuration here is being activated the time I double-click it. So all these geometry parts are being changed to the state that I've been uh, putting into that into that um, into that ent uh, entry here, and that way it's possible to create very complex data sets, um, considering materials as well. So you have material switches, for example. You have the option of turning lights on and off again, you can jump to a very specific viewpoint, for example, you can play animations uh, the time you double click that one here. Um, I can give you an example. We have one animation that is pre-configured, so it's the driver's door. So if I double click that one, my door is opening. So, and the only thing that is being entered in here is those two animations that on in one side opens the door and then closes it again and nothing else happens so this one should be en uh, empty here and once again if I double click it again it closes again because it's a sequential animation as well for the rear door that's the same so um, once you've created your logical structure and your variant set structure um, I don't want to go into much detail right now um, you're going to shade your uh, geometry. So, how do you shade your geometry? Um, the module you're going to need is the material editor. Okay, that one down here. I'm going to dock that into the right side. 
Okay, and now how do I shade my object? It's very easy to do because I, if I import my data set, usually, um, or sometimes at least, um, I have materials imported that still keep their material assignments, so their assignments to specific objects. And I'm going to use those assignments and just convert those material, uh, materials to a more appearing, uh, appealing material. For example, that paint here. I'm going to convert that one to a true light, let's say, to a metallic car paint. So I'm going to give that one a color. Let's say it's going to be something like that. Uh, something like that, for example. Uh, that's pretty pretty bright, but really doesn't matter. Okay, and now I can continue with all those materials here, with all those objects to convert those to. Um, well, let's make it a bit more like that, for example. So that way I can continue and convert all those materials to the. Um, corresponding materials, for, for example, brushed metal for my rims here, down here, and give it a, a preset. Let's say this one is aluminium, and I'm going to add a tire material, or I'm going just to create a plastic material, which is pretty dark. And later on, you could texture that one and make it a real tire. Um, I'm going to do that for a few more examples, just to convert it. On the other side, if you don't have those material assignments, okay, this could be the case as well. So how are you going to do that? Um, well, you can create new material of, uh, materials, of course. The way you do that is very simple. You just right-click into your material library and then create a new material. And let's say we're going to need a plastic, yeah, one of those here. It's not a generic material. Uh, so, and that plastic is going to be somewhat dark, like that one. And now I can drag and drop my material into my scene. And the funny thing is, as long as I don't release my mouse button, it won't be applied to my geometry. So, so I can keep on and test if this material looks good on the uh, geometry and if I hit the, the correct geometry as well. And if I don't want that, I'm going to drop it back into the material editor and nothing happens. But in this case, I'm going to drop it on that one. And here, for example, oops, and that one, so it looks better. It looks a bit better. Okay, and that would be one way to do it. The other way could be um, that I control um, my material assignment over my current selection. So let's say I want this here, shift click and shift control click. These both parts here. These glass parts uh, have to be somewhat glass. So um, I'm going to create a new material, create material, and then I'm going to create a glass material. And now I can apply this material to my whole selection. This could be a hundred parts that I have selected. So I'm just going to right click it and click on apply to select nodes. So what happens is that Fred applies my currently selected material to my current geometry selection. And I can look right into it. Okay. And this way I can begin and shade my whole, uh, my whole object here. I won't make it for the whole car, but um, let's say one is chrome, for example. That one here is chrome as well. Uh, it's not very reflective for some reason. Yeah, I know why. It doesn't really matter right now. And that one is black plastic. Um, it's just a few here. Okay, just to make you understand how the process works. So I have, I've hidden the glass cover here. I'm going to unhide it by right-clicking my whole car and clicking Show Subtree. And there we are again. Okay. Well, um, I won't do that for the whole car now. Um, I think um, the next step would be more important or is more interesting. Um, the next step would be lighting. So how do I apply um, lighting to my scene? That, that would be one, the next step in my data preparation process. There are a few ways um, to add 
uh, lighting to my scene, um, the simplest way would be uh, to create a helper geometry. Um, in the root node, I'm going to create, right-click create geometry. I'm going to create a sphere, which is, let's say, um, which has a seven meter radius. That should be big enough. I'm going to drag my root node into my scene. Okay, and this sphere here, I don't really know where it is. For some reason, oh, well, I, I don't really know where it is. Um, I'm going to apply a environment material to that uh, to that sphere to make it light my scene. So I have a default environment in my scene already, and I'm going to apply that one to my sphere. And I'm going to look for my sphere. For some reason, it disappeared. Oh well, okay, my my car was just uh, dislocated, so I'm going to move that one right there. Okay. And now, since we're in CPU rasterization mode, which is new in FRED Professional um, 2014, I'm going to switch, let's say, to full GPI, which is more interesting. So, and now I have to rotate the whole thing. Well, I think it's not on the right spot now. Okay, well, I have to transform it. Oh, well, we have Z up. For some reason, I don't know, really, I don't want to go into too much detail right now. For some reason, it's not showing me the, the whole dome here. But it doesn't really matter. I'm going back. Okay. So, what do we have? We have, oh, we have, I know that one here. It's, okay. We have basic lighting. Um, if we apply that environment to all materials, we have basic lighting based on the default environment that we have applied to our scene. That could be something else as well, like um, let's create a skylight material, for example. That's a skylight system that we've implemented in FRED. As you can see, that one offers a light situation based on daily light um, situations, which I can control. Well, okay, let's simulate the light um, situation today, uh, now, um, and let's say we're in Berlin already, so and now we need a plane to create a shadow, for example, a plane that is five times five meters. Move that around here, make it a bit bigger. Move it under the car and create a shadow material that accepts or draws shadows. Okay, there's nothing visible right now because we are in CPU rasterization mode. But once we move into full GI, for example, which is a high-quality render mode, we have real-time shadow on the shadow ground and based on the light situation, which we can still control over um, its rotation, for example. Not that one here, but the rotation, for example. We can turn the shadows and manipulate our, our lighting, for example, or make it an evening situation. Oh, no, that's the render mode we're going to use full GI mode for that because it looks nicer. This is one way to um, to light your objects, for example. Another way would be to use so-called X lights, or in, in our case we are using area lights. <clears throat> um, to demonstrate that I need um, the light editor. Okay. And I'm going to create a new light, a spotlight in this case, and make it an area light with the shape of a rectangle and make it visible in reflections. And I'm going to position it, well, I'm going to use the CPU rasterization for interactivity. I'm going to place it somewhere up here. 
I'm getting it from the camera. Go back to my position. And now my, my light is I'm located pretty far up. As you can see, we already have additional shadow information coming from that area light. And I'm going to turn the skylight off for now. So set exposure to zero. And the only thing that emits light right now is my spotlight, so my area light. Um, since we're in CPU rasterization mode for interactivity, we still see some lighting because we have a ba uh, basic uh, default environment that offers light into our scene. Once I render it, I don't see anything because my intensity is still too low. So I need to resize that one. So I'm going to resize the spotlight, which is an area light by that time. And I'm going to make it something like that, for example. Yeah. Maybe a bit higher, for example, like that. I'm giving it an intensity of 10. So, okay, let's see how that works. Okay, this looks better already. Okay, and this is one of the of the excellent that I can set, but this isn't enough. Let's say I want another one for the side. Very easy to do. I'm going to reuse that spotlight here, duplicate that one, and move that one to the other side. make it like from the side and then I'm going to render it and now we have two lights that light up our scene. Okay, um, I hope you gained um, a closer insight on how to work with Fred a bit. I, I, I know it is not enough, but um, well, uh, most people ask me how to implement Fred in their processes and how the process itself works. So I hope you gained a closer insight on, on how, how to do that. Um, I would be through with my presentation now and I'd, yeah, well, I'd give back um, to my presenter, Owen. Can I? Hello, thank you, Claudio. Very interesting presentation there, an awful lot to take in, so I'm sure that we, uh, we have quite a few questions from the attendees. Um, and we have our first question now. Uh, the first is, uh, what measures inside VRED can be taken to automate parts of the data preparation and rendering process? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, a lot of uh, people ask me to make processes easier and how to um, speed up processes um, like um, data preparation, uh, assignment of materials, uh, data import, and things like that. Um, we have a very powerful um, Python um, API that allows you to um, assign materials based on a database, for example. Um, let's say you have a database where um, dependencies like what colors does a car offer or what, what rims does a car offer, where those dependencies are being modeled in. Um, a script that has to be written by a customer could read out those, uh, that information and build up your car from scratch just using that information, applying materials automatically from, for example, for, uh, from an uh, existing material library and use parts and import parts that only belong to that car. So the thing you have to do is to make sure that your um, product lifecycle management, your, your data structure is working, all the backend um, data is, is intact, and the things that this script does is it builds your car automatically or, well, um, at least huge parts of it automatically based on your um, database settings and your database models. That is one way to do. Um, as I said, um, using a material library is um, recommended because um, you could build up a sophisticated material library that many people in your company could use at the same time. So if you set it to readable only, for example, then many people in many different projects could use those generic materials automatically. And once they're updated on that central um, share, for example, then all those projects could be updated to the newest version of the settings of those materials automatically just by using this material library. That would be another way. Uh, but I think this is a very sophisticated approach to do that. 
Um, maybe um, we should talk um, more detailed about that if someone's interested in those processes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next question, is there any way to reload altered geometry without losing material assignments and such? Uh, definitely. So, um, well, this happens a lot because um, in the process of design and construction, um, many parts change over the time. So, let's say the headlamps change for uh, a month, for example, and you build up your car and you have a license and uh, you don't want to build a whole structure again because of those, um, beca only because of the headlights. So one way to do that, or uh, the most elegant way to do that, would be that you keep the references, um, I don't think I have any in that project file here, but um, yeah, that one for example, this one contains a path to a very specific file that has been imported, and using that reference path, I could just right click on it and reload that file or even replace it, or reload all the files. And then all those parts are being updated to the current state without losing material references as long as the parts are being named the same. So only the geometry changes and not uh, the naming. Then everything stays in place and the material assignments are being uh, made automatically by freight. Okay, great. Uh, we now have a question from Alan Oberhauser. Uh, when importing data from the PLM system, are NURBS maintained in red or are they discarded upon tessellation? Well, um, right now with the um, service pack 1, uh, they are not being uh, kept in the FRED file, but um, the plan is that those uh, or that information will be kept in the future with the tessellated geometry so that you have the chance to retessellate your data uh, when you have the need. So let's say you tessellated some object and it turns out that it is just too rough and not detailed enough. So um, you keep the, um, the NURBS information in the file, in the FRED project file, and just retessellate your, your, your object. And that is very fast and you get, or you, you get another tessellation menu here which offers you um, to enter specific uh, tessellation options. And then you can retestate that whole object over and over again and still keep the NURBS data until it fits your needs, of course. Great. Uh, another question from Torsten Steinborn. Uh, will it be possible to generate variants if they are not below a single node? If they're not below a single node? Um, Okay, will it be fun? Well, it's hard for me to understand. Maybe you should point that out in a bit more t detail. Okay, I'm sure it's Well, uh, it's, I, I don't get that one because, uh, well, if it's below one node. Okay, sorry, I, I don't get that one, sorry. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, next one from uh, Bjorn uh, Lohman. Why should we use Fred instead of Showcase? Does it differ that much? Okay, um, what I could do is I could show you on a proper data set the quality and the performance. Because right now what I'm showing is something that shows the process where I could demonstrate how to, um, how to shade things, how to move things around and, and add variants or construct variants and variant sets. But if I showed you a, a proper data set, you would see um, that Fred and I'm not talking or, um, well, I'm not comparing anything, but he would see that the quality is outstanding regarding, in, regarding things of performance because you always have to make comp compromises regarding performance and quality. But depending on the time you have, Fred offers, uh, well, photorealistic quality in such a small amount of time. And that is the, the great thing that well, speaks for Fred, I think. It is the flexibility. You have so many things you have, or well, you can configure yourself. Variant sets. You can script almost everything you need. You can, well, you can add interactivity. Let's say you want, in a interactive presentation, for example, um, you want to demonstra uh, demonstrate something. Oops, there we have the light again. I want to demonstrate something like 
Yeah. So you can key specific animations to nodes in, in the scene, to uh, a very specific node uh, on, on your car. You have so many different approaches and applications you can, uh, you can cover with that tool, with that one tool. And, and I think it speaks for Fred, the, the image quality, the performance where you can work, when you can work, and the interactive feedback. I mean, this is, this is not a very complex data right now, but we're talking about full GI right now on one machine. It's not a cluster system in the background, it's just me, and I'm working on a huge display here. Just going to cut the scene graph once more. Oops. This is the error light I'm, I'm cutting through. And even now, it still, um, still gives me feedback that is acceptable. And that is, amongst other things, something that speaks for Fred, I guess. OK. Uh, Antonio Bertolucci. Uh, hi, uh, Claudio. Can you import materials from Maya and or 3ds Max? Um, at the moment, this is not possible, but um, as I know, um, <coughs> well, as I know that um, there are people who think or, well, at least um, evaluate such an option. Okay. Uh, but right now, at the moment, it's not, it's not the case. So we'll wait for that one. Uh, Bert Grohlman. What kind of measured materials can be used? Are they inter interacting correctly to your light in GI? Regarding that, I would recommend to listen to the first webinar, which uh, was held by Mr. Grasse a few weeks ago, because he has been focusing on exactly that um, on that point. So it would well, I would recommend to listen to that webinar again, because he has been. Uh, talking about that a lot and has been showing the quality and res the response of the material. Great, and uh, just to remind everybody, you can you can see all the previous webinars on the uh, the Car Design News website. Uh, moving on to our next question is from Jun Wu. Uh, Hi, Claudia. I'm Mark Wu, alias QA of ACRD. My question is: Does Red uh, use the animation data which is built into Maya or other third animation programs such as camera motion path or geometry motion path? Well, um, what I understood is, well, the, the connection was a bit bad right now. Is, could, you, could you repeat that? It would be better, I guess. Of course, yeah. Uh, just to repeat the question from Jun Wu. Um, does Vred, uh, sorry, can Vred use the animation data which is built into Maya or other third animation programs, such as camera motion path or geometry motion path? Well, um, animations from Maya can be imported. Um, and if I may talk about that a bit more, even vertex animations can be imported, as well as Alembic caches. So yes, and there should be a possibility of exporting Maya animations into FRED. Great, and going back to uh, Torsten Steinborn's previous answer, which caused uh, some slight confusion, to remind you, his first question was, uh, will it be possible to generate variants if they are not below a single node? Um, and he's come back to, to ask, um, in a given example, where all untanned variants uh, are directly below the node? Um, so, for example, if, if they're from a mix of different nodes, is it then possible to create variant rules? Um, okay, this, this one's, well, um, I, can, I can talk a bit um, more generally about the variants, because um, I think um, I didn't get his answer wrong, or, well, his question um, wrong, because um, Variants themselves do not necessarily um, contain any nodes. So I could create, for example, I could create a new variant um, switch here. This is just a switch. So this one could stay empty. Um, 
I think what he means are things like probably symbolic links or things like that. Um, switches can be um, cascaded. So um, I could create a switch, for example, I could create one and two groups in it and then create another switch and that one depends on the setting that I've uh, made in switch one here for example. Okay, this is switch one. Okay, this must be switch two. And this is switch one. So um, the setting of whether whether anything within switch one is visible or not depends on the setting that I've made in switch one. So uh, if if I want switch two or the settings in switch two to be visible, it is necessary to set switch one to group two in in there. So I don't know if that was the question. Maybe um, you should write me an email or something like that, or you maybe. Um, so we could talk a little bit more in detail about that, but um, I, I, I don't think I got the uh, I got the question correctly. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll definitely put you. I'm sorry. Up. Sorry. <laughs> um, moving on to the next question from Nicholas Quayle: Can you reference geometry in red? Yes, you can. Uh, I could demonstrate that on. So right now what you see is 3.5, around 3.5 gigabytes of RAM are being taken up by um, my whole data set here. What I could do now is I could create a clone. Uh, I'm going to do that. And that clone, okay, this, this takes a bit of time because references have to be made. And that takes a few seconds, so okay, that, that was it. And I could move that clone around, and we have still okay. Well, maybe a megabyte came came onto those 3.5 gram, <laughs> but it's really nothing. And I could now move that whole data set around. Okay, there are two cars, two polos, and this is reference geometry. Okay, the thing with a reference. Geometry is that um, once I change something in the original geometry, it also changes in the reference. So that is something I keep in mind. Um, a way to avoid that would be to not to create a clone, but to create a duplicate, okay, which is a direct copy. So once again, I could create a clone, one, one more clone out of that clone I've already made. Even that one takes only a few seconds. And now I have three polos in my in my scene. Okay, I hope this answers this question. I'm sure it did. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, another one from Bert Gorman. Um, what's the time drawback using NURBS whilst rendering? Um, ex excuse me, I didn't get that one because the line some <laughs> was something some bad. Uh, the question was, what is the time drawback in using nerves whilst rendering? Okay, um, well that's a tough question because um, that depends heavily on, on what you're drawing and how exact your, um, your, your model is. I mean, nerves rendering itself is slower than rendering based on uh, test data geometry. Um, I cannot really give an exact number, um, but from my experiences, from my experiences, and it's only my experiences, we're talking about maybe 30% drawback, maybe. But it heavily depends on your scene and the settings you've made. There is nothing I can say that works for every scene, so um, really that is just guessing, maybe. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a, a question there which you might not want to give a straight answer to, but um, Carl Siebert asks, how would you compare RED to RTT's Delta Gen? Um, well, that is a question that I would like to redirect to our product managers then, because I, I'm, I, I do not feel fit to answer that question right now. 
Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. Um, next question from Bruno Arena. Um, is it possible to export a web model to C on the web, to export to web? Um, well, there are projects that allow you to view an online uh, version of your 3D um, data set. That means that one way could be that you offer a streaming of your current view to the web. For example, it could be available as a view to uh, customers, for example, um, where I can turn or they can turn the world themselves, used as an uh, online um, configurator, for example. That would be possible, of course, yeah. Um, there, we have a few products um, that could do that, actually. But um, talking about that would take a lot of time, and this depends heavily on the application and what the customer wants to do. And I think there is more talk necessary about that. But okay, yeah, okay. it is possible, yeah. Uh, another question. Um, when NURBS are maintained, will there be the ability... The line is very bad right now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, now it's better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when NURBS are maintained, will there be the ability to export a configured data set in a NURBS format? For example, IGES, STEP, WIRE, FBX, etc. Um. The import is possible, but at that point I uh, think it is not possible to export um, something like that in the iTOS format. Okay. Um, Nicola Alan wants to know uh, what is the size of your data assembly? Um, of this data set here? I assume so, yes. Um, well, actually I don't know. I really don't know, because that is a data set that, that we've been given, or I was given, to, because I was, was about to hold this presentation here. I didn't care about that. But um, since it's uh, an official data set, a reduced official data set, I really don't know. But that is information we get. Radio, hello, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat my previous question. Okay. Kevin Johnson, how does VRED work with the K2000 and Tesla Maximus card solution? Can you repeat that one, please? Yeah. How does VRED work with the K2000 and Tesla Maximus card solution? Tesla card solutions, uh, if I got that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, well, that's something I have no information of. Uh, that will be something that our product managers can answer. Uh, thanks. Uh, just going on to the next question. We've only got time for a couple more. Um, can you load back the data you created in Vred in Alias Auto Studio? Well, that depends on uh, what formats, and I'm not really informed what kind of formats it can read. That depends on the formats um, it accepts. So, the, well, Fred and can export the complete scene or just select the geometry in a few formats. So if you take a closer look at that, um, there should should actually be a format that can be um, read in that software. So, um, well, it's not everything that is supported as an export format because of licensing things and, yeah, well, um, 
there should be something that can be read in that software. But, um, well, yeah, I, I'm not really informed about the formats that the software can read. Okay, great. Well, we're fast running out of time, and the questions are getting very technical. Uh, but we will yeah. forward all of them on to, uh, to Claudio. Um, and I'm sure that he'll, um, if he doesn't know the answer himself, he'll certainly find somebody uh, he Sure, does. sure. Many things are related to, um, well, things that only product managers um, are fit to answer. So um, it's somewhat problematic for a technician like me to answer those things. So um, I hope everybody understands that. Absolutely, I'm sure they do. Um, so it just remains for me to say uh, thank you very much, Claudio, for a really fascinating presentation. Uh, thanks for everybody who joined us today. Uh, this webinar, like all previous ones, is going to be updated, loaded, sorry, onto Carlos Arnese's archives and accessible in future for yourselves and your colleagues who have been able to attend the live presentation. You can access this and any previous webinars under the Processes tab on the CDN homepage. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again for our next webinar. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you, too. Bye-bye.